Recently, the CCP has introduced new rules related to delivery. These regulations include requiring recipients to provide real name identification during pickup, implementing a privacy policy to protect user information, allowing consumers to demand compensation for delayed, lost, damaged, or missing items, encouraging the use of advanced technology like automatic sorting machines, and promoting the use of eco-friendly packaging materials. Additionally, the regulations aim to enhance the management of delivery vans by enforcing speed limits and weight restrictions for electric tricycles used in deliveries. On paper, this seems good, but the consequence is very catastrophic. The Zhongtong Express Qingxiu branch in Nanning has already collapsed. Management is in chaos, and parcels are not being delivered for several days. The branch has relocated, making it impossible to find via navigation. Their phone is switched off. The new regulations have reduced how many parcels delivery workers can handle per day, further lowering their earnings. Merchants may pass higher delivery fees onto consumers through increased prices. In the end, the common people are the ones hurt most by the changes and resulting chaos in the delivery industry. With the implementation of the new express delivery regulations, parcels that were supposed to be promptly delivered are now piling up like mountains, with no one able to handle them in a timely manner. Delivery personnel have stated that the new regulations require them to deliver on time and enhance parcel security checks, but the time allotted is clearly insufficient. They are facing immense work pressure and unreasonable income conditions. Ultimately, they chose to collectively resign in protest of these new regulations, causing a significant impact on the entire industry. Goods are piling up, parcels are stuck, and consumers are voicing their complaints. It notes that fines are often borne by delivery people when packages are damaged or lost. Most delivery services don't do doorstep delivery as personnel are paid per package, so they often drop packages at smart lockers or delivery centers to save time instead of doorstep delivery. While this improves efficiency for personnel, it leaves some consumers dissatisfied who must spend extra time collecting packages sometimes with added fees. However, some believe delivery centers are convenient for collecting packages on the way home from work or safer for women who don't want strangers knowing their home address. The resignation of delivery people has also made it difficult for companies to recruit workers after the new year. Goods are now take too long to pack, leading them to pile up like mountains. This looks like an apocalyptic world where civilization collapses. Delivery workers in China are facing increasingly difficult working conditions due to low wages, rising workloads, and fines. Their wages are decreasing while delivery demands and hours are increasing, making the job unbearable. F workers are responsible for delivering packages in assigned areas without help from colleagues and do not take holidays. A government survey found that nearly half of delivery workers work 10 to 12 hours a day, while fines are another major burden. A new wave of resignations has hit the courier industry in China, with one out of every five couriers quitting their jobs. This comes in the wake of new regulations that have significantly impacted the work of delivery personnel. The question remains, are these changes beneficial for couriers, or have their incomes taken another hit? I heard a courier stated, previously, we could deliver around 200 packages a day. With the new regulations, we can barely manage 80 at most. Couriers now face increased pressure as they need to communicate with each buyer, which takes considerable time. This inevitably leads to a decrease in delivery efficiency and, consequently, a reduction in income. On average, couriers earn around 1 yuan per package delivered. With the added cost of using delivery stations, even if a courier manages to deliver 200 packages a day, their income would only amount to around 80 yuan, 11 US dollars and 12 cents. The number of delivery people for takeout these days is just not what it used to be. This isn't just a joke, it's becoming a reality. A few years ago, delivering takeout was relatively easy. Making a monthly income of 20,000 RMB was achievable. Even in the past couple of years, with some effort, hitting a monthly income of over 10,000 yuan, roughly 1,400 US dollars, wasn't a big issue. Looking at the current market, I feel like mere effort isn't enough anymore. It feels like we have to push ourselves to the limit just to maintain what used to be normal. 
The food delivery industry is becoming increasingly challenging, with declining order prices and longer delivery distances. The average order price has dropped from 5 yuan to 4 yuan, while the delivery distance has increased from 3 to 4 kilometers to 6 to 7 kilometers. Many people have asked me why I haven't been creating short videos or posting content recently. The truth is, sometimes silence doesn't mean there's nothing to say, rather, there are moments when words simply fail to capture the complexity of the situation. However, one positive aspect is that this year's weather hasn't been as cold as in previous years. Aside from having low wage, huge workload, delivery personnel are constantly being disrespectful in China. Delivery riders do not deserve the blame and responsibility unfairly placed on them. Delivery delays are primarily caused by platform and restaurant issues, not the riders. Riders face consequences for these delays despite not being at fault. In the service industry, customers should not constantly trouble delivery riders for minor issues like missing utensils, as the food is prepackaged and sealed by the restaurant. Riders cannot open and check every order. Restaurants sometimes improperly package hot and cold items together against the rider's advice, leading to customer complaints and penalties for the rider. Some locations like train stations and airports are inaccessible without tickets, yet customers insist on delivery and are unwilling to meet the rider outside. Certain residential complexes also restrict access, making deliveries challenging. There is a prejudice against allowing delivery riders to voice these realities. Riders are told to accept the low pay and demanding work or quit. This blaming the victim mentality allows those taking advantage of the system to avoid consequences, while riders bear the burden for these issues. It is unfair to direct platform-related issues and conflicts toward delivery riders and mistreat them over a small delivery fee. Not to mention, China has witnessed a significant contradiction within its economic narrative. On one hand, the country boasts a massive middle-income population, reportedly surpassing 400 million individuals, according to the National Bureau of Statistics. On the other hand, prominent TV host Bai Yen Song has pointed out a stark reality. Despite this ostensible prosperity, the Chinese populace remains reluctant to open their wallets, which further makes the life of delivery personnel much, much worse. This hesitancy towards spending has sparked heated discussions and critiques, especially in the context of the country's evolving consumer behaviors and the impact on various sectors, especially the delivery industry. The number of people ordering delivery has become less than the number of delivery riders. I have a feeling that after the pandemic restrictions were lifted, consumers have become more reluctant to spend money, especially now in 2024. I'm not sure of the exact reason, but it seems that every day, there is a large influx of new riders entering the delivery industry. It's evident that after the pandemic, various industries are not as prosperous as they appear on the surface. Take our situation here as an example. In the past, few people were willing to join LaPeo, a food delivery platform, and team leaders had to make numerous phone calls to persuade and entice riders to join. However, now, if you want to sign up for LaPeo, it's nearly impossible to get in. In Guangzhou, priority is given to those with connections and familiar with the ropes. Those who don't understand the intricacies of the industry won't last long in LaPeo. Currently, every week, there are dozens or even hundreds of riders queuing up to join LaPeo, and in many places, LaPeo has no available shifts and doesn't assign orders. Sometimes, customers just refuse to pay fees, making delivery much more difficult. This is nonsense. Even you can't pay your own fee, can you? You can't even cover the measly one US dollar and 40 cents delivery fee for a single person's takeout order and make me pay it. How much is the delivery fee again? Damn it, I am short by 40 cents. For two US dollars and eight cents, what can I even get? A whole chicken costs three US dollars and 61 cents, and the delivery fee ranges from 2.02 to two US dollars and 22 cents. So you only have about five yuan in your pockets after the measly 10 yuan, isn't it? Okay, I'm out now. The core of the issue lies in the definition of China's middle income group, which may be overly inclusive by some standards. For instance, anyone earning a monthly income exceeding 3,000 yuan, 435 US dollars approximately, is classified within this demographic. Given such parameters, 
It's not surprising that a vast portion of China's 1.4 billion population fits into this category. However, in reality, a monthly salary of 3,000 yuan barely suffices for a modest lifestyle in second-tier cities, covering basic expenses such as rent, utilities, and food, with little to nothing left for savings. This situation is at odds with the traditional Chinese predisposition towards saving for emergencies and future needs, further discouraging discretionary spending. The reluctance to spend is further exacerbated by the burgeoning consumer debt, which, as of the third quarter of 2023, saw household debt-to-income ratios rise albeit slightly. The societal pressure of maintaining loan repayments for homes and cars adds another layer of financial stress, deterring any form of high consumption. Evidently, this conservative spending behavior has found reflection on social media, with young people championing low-cost travel hacks and aggressively seeking discounts online, epitomizing the cautious spending habits of what is dubbed the middle class in China. Despite the considerable increase in personal deposits in Chinese banks, particularly during the post-pandemic years, the distribution of wealth remains uneven, with a small fraction of high-net-worth individuals holding a significant proportion of these deposits. By Yensong's commentary hints at a broader economic issue, the need to convert saved wealth into active consumption to stimulate market dynamism, create jobs, and elevate income levels across the board. The delivery sector in China, once thriving during the lockdowns and restrictive phases of the pandemic, has felt the brunt of this spending apprehension. Initially, platforms like Meituan and Misfresh saw exponential growth as consumers, confined to their homes, turned to these services for their daily necessities. However, as life in China inches back to normalcy, these platforms face a major slowdown. This downturn is not only due to the easing of pandemic restrictions, but is metaphoric of a larger trend of reduced discretionary spending among Chinese consumers. The anticipation of consumers returning to physical stores and restaurants, coupled with their tightened purse strings, means average order values on these platforms are likely to shrink, affecting their revenue and growth prospects. Furthermore, U.S. companies witnessing this trend are becoming increasingly selective about their investments in China, closely monitoring these shifts in consumer behavior and the broader implications for the Chinese economy. This cautious approach by foreign investors could signal a lack of confidence in the market's ability to rebound to its pre-pandemic consumption levels. As China's delivery industry crumbles under the weight of regulatory chaos and consumer spending hesitancy, the future looks increasingly grim. With delivery workers resigning en masse and orders plummeting, the sector faces a bleak outlook. Foreign investors wary of the market's instability further compound the economic woes. Without swift and decisive action to address these challenges, the downward spiral seems inevitable, casting a shadow over China's economic prospects.